Welcome to another episode of The Embedded, an ongoing exploration of the space between the glass and the technology. In our last episode, we spoke to Wes Yun, Director of User Experience at Motorola, about innovation and the design process in the mobile industry. Today, in part two of the series, we delve into the philosophy of creating a user experience and what the future holds for devices. I guess where we left off, we talked a little bit about, I guess you'd call it design maturity. Mm -hmm. And an interesting thing that, that we had talked about in the past is that you've been part of, I've been part of organizations or, or companies that had really great ideas and then they got stomped on, they, yeah. got, they crashed, and then those exact same ideas came back and are now successful. Yeah. Right? A little bit about your, your past so we can kind of frame it. Sure. One of the projects I, I worked on was a, a project called Movie Link. Uh, it was for Sony at the time, and it was this crazy idea of streaming movie content over the internet. Hmm. You may have heard of such things. Fascinating. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> tanked. Completely yeah. tanked. Uh, you know, all the studios bought it and then proceeded to kill it. The internet wasn't quite mature. Computers weren't quite mature. There needed to be some time. And I think that the time is coming soon. Right. Um, and we see that happening with Google TV and ITV. And you can now watch movies on your tablet or your phone. Mm -hmm. yeah. As someone was telling me, like, such a huge percentage of Hulu's streaming happens to corporate IP. Really? Yeah, so yeah. most people are watching Hulu at work. Really? Um, I can tell you, though, 0% of Hulu goes to Canada. Oh, right. It's the deals that were made. Right. And those deals were based on a different technology. So those, right. those deals have to change. That's you right. Know? Even in the, in the musical space. Right. You know, there was Napster, and, and we did a lot of work with a company called Fine-Tune, and then, then the, the, the labels squashed that. Right. And now look what happened. You've yeah. got Spotify and all of these, and the labels right. bringing those back up, you know? Yeah. So I wonder, this is just a, uh, this is a, a really well-formed theory that I just thought of. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Go on. <laughs> if, if you want to look a little bit into the future, I wonder if we should start looking at what's crashing right now. Yeah. You know? No, it's exactly right. There it is. See what's crashing today <laughs> and then design for the experience five years out. Yeah. You know, music is a great example. Mm -hmm. I, ha I have Spotify, I have Pandora, I have uh, Amazon Music, I have Google Music, I've got iTunes, right. and I've got my stuff everywhere, Yeah. right? And I paid for it, you know? I should be able to access my music from anywhere, anyhow. If you can design an experience around what that would be like, mm -hmm. that's designing five years out. When we talk about the embedded space, one of the, one of the things that, um, uh, the, the, that I, kind of play with as a future thinking thing. We talk about personalization and how important personalization is and how personalization is, is driving adoption of things. It's, uh, I mean, we, we were doing an outdoor signage project where you, you walk up to it and it, it tailors the advertising just for you, you know, be, based on knowing you're a male, you're, you know, 30 something years old. You know, you're devastatingly handsome, that kind of yeah. a thing. You know? It always um, happens. Yeah, <laughs> constantly. <laughs> Your musical preferences are in the cloud, you know, so that wherever you go, you can bring those with you. I wonder how far that's going to go because my own theory is that your interface mm -hmm. will be personalized to you and you will bring that along with you. Like I always say that we're, we're part of this 100-year uh, evolution of the user experience, mm -hmm. right? And we started with uh, punch cards and yeah. keyboards and mice, and now we're in the touch and the, t right. the touch list, the gestures, the voice-driven interfaces, and all right. that. the The more the more we evolve towards a natural user interface, right. the more nuanced it has to be. Right. The more subtle it has to be. The more right. specific to me it has to be. So, in order to keep moving along that, there has to be some way in which the interface itself comes with me or knows my, my nuances. What do you think of that? <laughs> Mind blown. <laughs> I don't know. I think that that's absolutely right. Uh, you, you know, for a long time, we had to learn the technology, and now technology is learning about us. But there is such a huge amount of data that is being gathered that just isn't parsed and used correctly. <laughs> you know, it's just, you know, every once in a while you get directed mail or something like that that you're like, how did they know about that? Right, <laughs> or, yeah. You know, sometimes you're like, it's so niche. 
how could they have known that? Yeah. Why are all the ads about the thing that I just bought now? That's yeah. so strange. <laughs> yeah, that's a, a horrible use of really rich data. If you're carrying with you everything in the cloud, right, and that, right. that everything gets personalized with the cloud, then the interfaces that, that you're interacting with, mm -hmm. because they're connected, then they're really all part of one grand interface, aren't they? Sure. They're, not, they're not points anymore. What you're talking about is just technology becoming more ubiquitous and smarter. It's just a matter of time before those things connect you, and they're all going to connect you through Facebook. Yeah. <laughs> well, they have to connect you through something. They have to connect you through something. Your device, it is the, the portal through which you do everything. It knows everything that you do. It knows who you talk to. It knows when you talk to them. It knows what you do, when you do it, how frequently you do it. It just seems like the natural place, the hub. But, it, you know, it's not the hardware itself. It's, it's your identity. And, and so if you can harness that information without being weird, creepy, and or too salesy, where it's actually useful. There's value there. There's value there. I, well, Google's the king of that, right? Absolutely, but I mean, it, I still think that they do things pretty ham-fisted, just not, it's not at that level of subtlety where you're, where it feels magical. Right, yeah. Or where it feels helpful. <laughs> mm -hmm. It just feels intrusive mm -hmm. sometimes. It feels wrong. Mm -hmm. and it, it's always this thing, this delicate balance between how many times do you have to get something wrong before you piss someone off? Right. And I think that they get it more wrong than right. Mm -hmm. But that's just a matter of time. So what about uh, spreading experiences across screens? In my mind, it's easy to do. Right. In actuality, it's very hard For to sure, do. For sure, yeah. It's almost like the, the, the um, users, customers, want that to happen. Oh, yeah. But there's very few companies that can actually make it happen. Yeah, I, I think uh, what you're tapping into is ecosystems, right? And there are probably only three viable ecosystems, mm -hmm. and I want them to work harmoniously. Right. At some point, people will clamor enough so that it'll happen, but, mm -hmm. or maybe it won't. Mm -hmm. Who knows? But the desire is there for my stuff to be free. Yes, yeah, so there's a lot of challenges for this type of innovation. Yeah, I think this is the, the next big thing. You need things like flinging to your television to yeah. be as, uh, as appliance-like as turning on a toaster, right? Right. It should, it should just work. Exactly. Yeah. But in order for it to just work, everybody has to play nicely together. It's never the lack of imagination of what we can do as a designer. Mm -hmm. it, it's always other things that obstruct, mm -hmm. whether it's technology or business deals. I mean, we're, we're humans solving human problems. If you're not solving human problems, then you're never going to have customers. <laughs> and so the only way to understand human problems is to not make assumptions, but mm -hmm. then to really ask the right questions. It's really to observe people and their uh, behavior, understand where their pain points are, and then try to solve those. Sometimes it's as difficult as you know, just wanting to connect with somebody. That's really hard. You know, because all, all of your sort of emotions and our, or, or feelings are abstracted through a piece of hardware technology. And so it's difficult to emote, it's difficult to convey nuance. These kinds of things are real pain points mm -hmm. that exist. I have a daughter and I would love to just tell her, hey, I'm thinking about you, right? right? Just, you don't have to reply back, you don't have to say what's up, dad, or whatever. It's just, I just want you to know that I'm thinking about you. She doesn't get a warm and fuzzy every time she gets a, a tweet from me. You know? Right, like, right. So there, there are things that are difficult to do, uh, but the, the desire to connect, the desire to be involved in another person's life, be social, those are, those are real problems. I, I think that's a perfect spot to, to, to end the universality. The, uh, the universality. <laughs> it's a nice closure. Yeah. Thank you so much. It, it's been amazing. Sure. Uh, good to see you. Yeah, good to good, see you. Good to, good to hook up, and, and, and uh, I really am looking forward to all the top secret stuff that you're not allowed to talk about. Yeah. <laughs> Soon enough. Right. So that's it for uh, one more edition of We Are Embedded. Join the conversation at weareembedded.com.